For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, with another readout video from our latest free Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter, in which we bring you some cool data that isn't. Specifically, a recent project by Tony Heller, whose work in the archives has long commanded our admiration, namely, to examine the ways in which U.S. government scientists adjust historical temperature readings. And one of the ways they adjust them is always down in the past, and the further back you go, the further down they adjust the readings. It seems that wherever they check them, whether it's in Colombia or the Central African Republic or Crawfordsville, Indiana, they find not only that the people reading thermometers in the past were prone to overstate the temperature, but that the further back you go, the more they overstated it. And how do they know? I mean, they can't go back and measure what the temperature really was in those places back then. And how could the same systematic bias have crept in in so many widely scattered places over the decades? Look, it's certainly possible that temperature readings in the past were inaccurate because the thermometers were imprecise, the people were careless, or both. But if that's what happened, then you'd expect the errors to be random and essentially cancel out. Whereas instead, apparently, the theory is that decades ago, all the thermometers that they bought for these weather stations, or all the people they hired, overestimated the temperature, and each decade they got a little bit better. But if that's the case, we want to know how they think it happened, and we want to see some evidence that it's reasonable to assume that it did. For instance, at the Cali Cali Puerto station in Colombia, we're asked to believe that in the last 20 years, the readings were essentially accurate. But in the 1970s, they were consistently about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit too high. In the 1960s, they were 2 to 3 degrees too high. And in the 1950s, an astounding 5 degrees too high. So I ask again, what possible set of circumstances could have created that pattern? Because I can certainly explain how it could happen that people today were so sure that it's getting warmer that they imposed their convictions on the facts. Especially since, as noted, Heller demonstrates that it's not just this one station. Over in Buar, in the Central African Republic, the adjustment back to the 1950s was, gosh, looky here, right about 5 degrees Fahrenheit, same as in Colombia. Did they shop at the same thermometer store? Did they hire people from the same defective school of meteorology? What's the theory that could possibly justify these claims? In the newsletter, we also note that in mid-December, the New York Times reported that, quote, survivors face sub-zero temperatures after quake kills over 120 in China, end quote. And, given how the Times has the vapors about warm weather, you might think they were producing this cold spell as a happy postscript to an otherwise tragic disaster. Instead, uncharacteristically, they actually admitted that sub-zero temperatures are miserable and extremely dangerous, especially when you don't have reliable heating in your home or, indeed, because of an earthquake, have a home at all. Not to mention the headline, quote, Russia hits Ukraine with new missile barrage as cold sets in, end quote. We're obviously being the target of a Russian attack is the main problem, but also having temperatures in the hottest year ever fall to minus 18 Celsius compounds the problems for combatants and civilians alike. Also in December, the Washington Post had the gall to write, quote, as Alaska's climate gets wetter, snowstorms put the homeless in peril, end quote, which is the kind of unreflective stuff that gets written on climate as if being homeless in an Alaskan snowstorm was just peachy and wholesome until about five years ago. And speaking of cold, in Western Canada, someone posted on January 11th over a weather map showing frighteningly low temperatures. We're talking about roughly minus 30 degrees Celsius from Smithers, B.C. to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, quote, just a friendly reminder that our government is taxing us on heating our houses to stay alive, end quote. Or, for instance, the news story saying, quote, extreme cold leaves thousands without power in Nordic countries, end quote. Yes, even in advanced economies, a combination of bad weather and bad policy can create potentially lethal circumstances. In this case, with the weather dipping as low as minus 38 degrees Celsius, which, by the way, is very similar in Fahrenheit, minus 36.4, when the two converge, the actual meeting place is minus 40, which surely everybody understands is directly life-threateningly cold. However, a story popular with the usual suspects is that, as Reuters' Sustainable Switch puts it, quote, risk specialists see extreme weather and misinformation as most likely to trigger a global crisis in the next couple of years, according to a recent World Economic Forum survey, end quote. 
as in the misinformation that the weather's getting worse when the data say otherwise? Or isn't that the kind they had in mind? And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you, our viewers and our readers. Because we're crowdfunded, we're not subsidized by governments, we don't get grants from giant environmental foundations, and we're not getting those oil company checks our critics keep talking about. It's you who sustain our work. So please click here and make a monthly pledge, $5, $10, $20, so that we can keep producing these videos and pushing back against mistaken, even deranged climate orthodoxy. And now, back to me. Meanwhile, Canada's climate-obsessed natural resources minister, whose wife awkwardly invests in fossil fuel stocks, tweets, quote, Are you between the ages of 18 and 30 and interested in energy, natural resources, and strategies to help combat climate change? Apply to be a part of at NRC Can's next cohort of our youth council, end quote. Oh boy, where do we not apply? We also note a Fox News expose, so those inclined can attack the messenger instead, revealing that, to no sensible person's great surprise, coal-powered geopolitical menace China is actively subsidizing climate alarmists in the United States. Something called the Energy Foundation, or on tax documents, Energy Foundation China, though it's headquartered in San Francisco, most of its operations are in China, and it has, quote, a staff that boasts extensive ties to the Chinese Communist Party, end quote, and it, quote, contributed $3.8 million to initiatives in the United States, like phasing out coal and electrifying the transportation sector, end quote. And then they have the gall to say that deniers take dirty oil money. Also, having praised his work repeatedly, including in this week's first item, let us repeat here our one big disagreement with Tony Heller, which is that he thinks that climate alarmism is a fraud and a scam, and says so in virtually every post. The Manhattan Contrarian, another source for whom we have a very high regard, agrees. Drawing partly on Heller's work, he has published a series on, quote, the greatest scientific fraud of all time, end quote. But we take a very different view of all the deliberate and highly unscientific tampering with evidence. We think that the zealots at NOAA, and a great many other places, are not trying to scam us with claims that they secretly think are untrue. What's happening is, they're so utterly persuaded that their theory is right, that when the data don't fit it, as often happens, they conclude that the data must be wrong and needs to be fixed. And one reason we say so is that if they were cheating on purpose, they'd hide it better. But another is that, after a while, the perpetrators of a known fraud tire of constantly lying. And why would they be doing it? It's easier to believe, and more plausible, that climate alarmists are wedded to a flawed theory, and they've constructed ingenious ways to rationalize its many failures without facing the possibility that it might actually be untrue, let alone secretly in their hearts knowing it's untrue. And on this point, here, we're going to defer to the leading climate skeptic who recently tweeted, quote, Imagine being so intellectually deficient that you convince yourself anyone with a different opinion is corrupt, end quote. Oh, and that guy's name? Tony Heller. It's especially important here to understand how arrogant certainty leads people to misinterpret data with fierce conviction, because reporting on the supposed record-breaking recordiness of the scorching hell of 2023, a lot of the commentary really does border on fraud, but it's coming from the complacently ignorant side, not the deviously deceitful one. And here's an example. The New York Times Climate Forward wrote, quote, It's confirmed. 2023 was the planet's warmest year on record, and perhaps in the last 100,000 years. By far, end quote. But nothing of the sort has been confirmed. Indeed, the reverse is true. The Holocene climatic optimum was warmer, by far, than it is today. But again, we hasten to add that what we have here is something looking like fraud that's actually driven by conviction, not by cynicism. There's an irresponsible failure to check the facts, but it's due to reckless certainty not to a knowledge that they won't support your case. In fact, we wouldn't take an even money bet that the author of that piece has even heard of the Cl Holocene Climatic Optimum. Just as many such people don't seem to have heard that Arctic sea ice has been rebounding rapidly of late. You know, the usual suspects use pseudo-scary language like, quote, ninth lowest in the 45-year satellite record, end quote, for the December extent, which was actually well within the normal range. But the real question is, or would be for a properly curious person, how can it be that after this hottest year ever, one that smashed records, Arctic ice is growing fast? In fact, by January 9th, it was at its highest level for that date in 20 years, and 
That's from Tony Heller again in his ongoing battle with alarmists over whether the past matters. And how do they explain that the Arctic sea ice minimum has fluctuated without any downward trend since 2006? Well, they don't explain it because they don't know about it. Then there's the fact that it's well known, if not well explained, that Antarctica has not warmed at all over the last 40 years, even though we're told over and over that the poles are warming faster than the rest of the planet. Just as we're often told that wherever some given journalist happens to live is warming faster than the rest of the planet, which is hard to reconcile with the former claim since very few journalists are either penguins or polar bears. But not to worry, an octopus told them doom loomed, as in, quote, Antarctic octopus DNA reveals ice sheet collapse closer than thought, end quote. And again, we don't want to be rude about science, including the ingenuity that researchers often show in determining that certain rather unlikely looking things actually do constitute evidence. But we say it's dangerous to be so determined to reach a certain result that you'll lunge at any passing cephalopod. And speaking of making sure that you do check the facts, we bring another installment in our ECS in the Real World series, in which we've review reviewed many studies that estimate the Earth's equilibrium climate sensitivity, that's ECS, by observing actual conditions outside the window rather than staring at climate models inside the lab. And the data so far in our series have always been surface temperature observations from urban airports, not a great spot, sea surface data gathered intermittently by ships, and things of that sort. And so obviously there are a lot of problems with this record, even though, given its flaws, it still doesn't seem to indicate nearly as much warming as the models keep predicting. But by contrast, this week's study uses data from weather satellites, and they measure the temperature in the lower troposphere, that's the airspace from about 1 kilometer up to about 12 kilometers up, and the satellites do provide a complete sample for the whole world that's uncontaminated by things like urbanization or not keeping records on a ship very carefully. The problem, of course, is that satellite record only begins in 1979, and it's risky to compare it directly to earlier thermometer readings taken very close to the ground. But, as the authors of this study, John Christie and Richard McNider, point out, the computer models insist that the troposphere will respond more quickly than the surface to greenhouse warming, so 40 years should be enough to draw conclusions. Namely, that the warming trend due to greenhouse gases works out to only about 1 degree Celsius per century, which implies a short-term climate sensitivity to CO2 that's about half of the average climate model, and a long-term figure, once everything is settled out, that's still under 2 degrees Celsius, which again is about half of the average climate model. So, once again, the data says the models are wrong, and the people who make the models say the data is wrong. That's how they roll, and it's not because they're deliberately lying, it's because they're overcommitted to their theory. Although, speaking of mistreating data, Roger Pilkey Jr. has posted on his substack the draft of a paper that he submitted for review to a scientific journal on natural hazards, in which he argues forcefully that the latest version of the famous, highly effective clickbait billion dollar disaster data set published by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA or NOAA, fails to meet any of the data quality requirements set out by that renowned government agency, NOAA. In fact, while this thing supposedly authoritatively measures the number of major climate-related disasters in the U.S. each year, it fails any quality criteria you might mention and represents, Pilkey writes, quote, an egregious failure of scientific integrity, end quote. A government agency fudging the numbers to boost climate alarmism. We are shocked, shocked. But not because we think it's conspiracy, because we think these people are irresponsible zealots. Finally, from the CO2Science.org archive, a study of midge assemblages found in the sediments of Moose Lake in south-central Alaska, which shows, oddly, that for the last 4,000 years, temperatures have been cycling naturally while trending downward, with the Little Ice Age notching the lowest temperatures of the entire Holocene and the current warm period getting nowhere near the medieval or Roman warm ones. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I know how to read a thermometer. Thank you.